Welcome to Corwin's Teacher to Teacher podcast with host Carol Pelletier Radford. Carol is an experienced classroom teacher, university educator, founder of mentoringinaction.com, and author of four best selling professional books for teachers. She believes the best form of professional learning happens when teachers engage in authentic conversations and share their wisdom. In every episode, Carol and her guests share stories about pivotal moments in their careers, successful classroom strategies, and personal actions they take to minimize stress and stay healthy. The Teacher to Teacher podcast is a place to engage in authentic conversation and reflection with experienced educators. We hope these conversations will energize you, keep you inspired, and remind you why you chose to become a teacher. Welcome to season three of the Teacher to Teacher podcast. I am your host, Carol Pelletier Radford, and I'm thrilled to be part of a conversation with two very experienced educators. The theme for season three is based on the book I wrote titled Teaching with Light, 10 Lessons for Finding Wisdom, Balance, and Inspiration. Each of the 10 episodes for this season mirror the 10 lessons in the book. And today's episode is lesson eight, always be brave. And I have two very brave uh, guests with me today. And I'm happy uh, to have Dennis and Sean with me. And I'm gonna have each of the guests introduce themselves and tell me what you're doing right now in in the education field and then maybe a little backstory of how you kind of ended up here so sean welcome introduce yourself thank you so much carol hi my name is sean thomas i am um, a longtime educator this is my 20th year of teaching all in the same district the largest district in georgia and i have taught kindergarten second grade third grade but the majority of my career has been teaching multilingual learners um, in an elementary school, so K through five. And I'm currently the lead ML teacher, ML stands for multilingual learner, um, in my school building. Um, I got started teaching, I wanted to be a teacher since I was 13 years old when I went to visit my mom in New York, my mom, my aunt in New York because they were still in school. And I went to help her with her kindergartners and said, this is what I want to do with my life. And so ever since then, I've just been, I've been doing it and I love it. And it sounds like you were one of the many that of our listeners is there's several groups of people. Like I always wanted to be a teacher. Like I was the same way playing with my dolls and bossing all my siblings around. And then there's this whole group that of, of people that are teachers that I never thought of being a teacher and like I ended up teaching um, <laughs> and how did this happen? So thank you for sharing my story, which is I always wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> All right, Dennis, let your turn. Introduce yourself. What are you doing? How did you get into education? What's your little teacher story? Okay, let, let's go back. So Sean, you said 13, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think I'm yeah. around 12. <laughs> I got the magic of education. My sixth grade teacher, Mr. Levine, decided that he would teach his sixth graders Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, a completely madcap expedition. He was a, a first year teacher. Um, and that wasn't significant in and of itself. What was significant was he tried to introduce us to the idea that time and space were related and time and, and space could speed up and slow down. He said even um, time could slow down so much that maybe it would stop. Okay, so I was 12, and this is what Jean Piaget called the stage of formal operations, <laughs> categories, and, you know, touch things and figure out the world. And um, this guy gave me an incredible gift, an incredible gift. He let me argue with him. Oh. I, I, I said to him, Mr. Levine, there's no way that time can't stop. It is the nature of time that it cannot stop. And um, And not only did he let me argue with him in class, but he let me stay. We must have stayed for about an hour after school where I argued that time could not stop. Now, I've learned later on, if you look it up on Google, the expansion of the universe and time is slowing down. It's still expanding, but it's slowing down. And, uh, you know, astrophysicists will tell you it, it could happen, right? It could. Um, and, but, but that just lit a fire under me. 
And, and you wanted to become a teacher because he allowed that to happen I, I don't know. in I, junior high? There, there were a bunch of teachers I had where I just, yeah. Yeah. you are the coolest person in the whole world. Now, this is very important for teachers out there. You don't have to, you know, kind of try and play up to your image of what your students might think would be a cool teacher. Like a lot of young people in high school, I was very confused. My father was in Vietnam part of the time. You, you know, protests were going on. Political leaders had been assassinated. It was a mess when I was in high school. But you get you get a few good teachers. They don't all have to be great. Some of them were just, you know, solid teachers. Some of them were terrible. But you get a few great ones. And then you're like, what is this adventure? I want to be part of this thing. Yay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and you, a... and you, so that seed was planted similar to what happened to Sean. And, but you ended up as a professor. So tell us, so this is Dennis Shirley, everyone. And Dennis oh, is yeah. a research professor. So let's, so what are you doing now? Like that? Time stopped or didn't stop, and well, you're well, doing something now as an educator. What is that? Yeah, so, um, well, um, I just finished a, a book uh, for Corwin with Andy Hargraves called The Age of Identity, Who Do Our Kids Think They Are and How Do We Help Them Belong? And, and I feel like my mind is just so full of ideas that I, I needed to take a break from teaching full-time because there was so much I still wanted to get down and communicate and, and be in dialogue with people. So right now I'm in, I'm in a little bit of an interlude, um, but I'm going to dive back into it once I've kind of got a few more big ideas. So, you know, <laughs> being a professor is kind of fun because people pay you to think. Um, Yay! <laughs> have student engagement written about well-being, written about identity. You kind of, I, I try to be honest to what's happening in the schools and not just go in and say, here's what I'm interested in. Now let me research it. I try to be much more like, What's going on and what do you think is important in your building? And then let the educators and the students lead. I love that. And that that really relates to what we're going to talk about today, which is uh, bravery, courage. And in the book, Teaching with Light, one of the mantras uh, lesson is me telling teachers to always be brave. It's like we need to come from a place of bravery and be able to articulate um, our voices when we need to. And to do that, it's, uh, I'm hearing what you're saying, Dennis, you have to kind of pause, think, and we're, we're paid to think too. Teachers, we're always doers, but I, I think teachers in the classroom, in the front lines, um, part of that is thinking about what, what we, we, you know, want to do that supports our students. So Sean, when Wait, I say, go oh, on, Carol, can I, yeah, can I go Something that Dennis said that I think actually goes along with that, you talked about how your teachers are very different. And I think one of the bravest things a new teacher can do is to be themselves. Thank you. You don't have to be the idea of what you see on Pinterest, on TikTok, on Instagram. Just be who you are. And that's one of the bravest things a brand new teacher can do. Thank you for underscoring that. And it, it's really... Um... It's nerve wracking. Beginning teachers, I work with a lot of beginning teachers, are very nervous. And once I, I had the opportunity to do a video to interview students, and I said the question was, "What advice do you have to you, for your beginning teachers?" And the first thing that all the students said was, "Don't be so nervous. We're just humans." Because the teacher would try to come in and be the fake cool teacher like Dennis was talking about um, and the kids can see right through it for one thing <laughs> and uh, so thank you for saying that so what's always be brave mean to you in addition to that what else comes up for you Sean so to me um, always being brave means choosing those battles and standing up for them and so um as, as a teacher of multilingual learners, um, I've had to do that often in my career. So I'll tell you a story. Um, I had a principal, um, I'm going to call him Mr. M. And the state and the district has a way of how they fund uh, support and services for our multilingual learner students. And what I had found over the course of my career is that getting the most funding 
was not necessarily the best way to provide services. So one of the times I had to be brave was I had to go to my principal and say, I understand about FTE and funding. However, these are children and these are people first. And we have to remember that we have someone's child here. They have entrusted us to do what's best for this child. He was not happy with that. I had to give up part of my planning time. But I did that in order to make a space where my newcomer students were getting support that they needed. So that would, that's what bravery means to me is choosing those battles, you know, choose that hill you're going to die on and stand up even if your voice is shaking and right. doing what's best for the students in your front of you. Right. And, th- and that's that pause that Dennis was talking about. You have to pause and think and choose. It's not every single one. Yes. Uh, what, what, what is it? And, and what can we do? I always have the beginning teachers are very nervous about that though. What, what advice do you have? Like first your teacher is going to say, I am not going to say something to my principal the first year because I don't even really know what I'm doing. Uh, how, how do you organize that if you're early in your early career stage? What, what advice would you have related to how, how is that bravery going to show up? Well, I think, um, and you actually mentioned this in your book, is to ask for support. So okay. if there is something that you see that you aren't sure if that's the best way, go to a veteran teacher. Have that trusted person. It could be a grade manager. It could be a coach in your building. could be an assistant principal. And just ask questions. Can you tell me why it's done this way? Has it been done other ways? Is there a reasoning? And then if you find that, you know, you have an idea, you know, I'll tell people all they can tell you is no, but you can always go and say, I have an idea. Can I try this? That may be a way that a teacher can show bravery. I like that. It's just to and ask. I, and then the mentoring is, so that's a leadership that's emerging into teacher leadership. We talked about this uh, with my guests on episode seven about emerging teacher leaders with early career teachers, with the teachers coming in, that they don't have to wait for 20 years to be leaders. And part of being a leader is that voice and that being brave to speak up and come up with a solution too. It sounds like you had a solution, like you were proposing something. Yes, you gave up your planning time. I probably hear listeners going, oh, I don't really want to give up my planning time to do this. But sometimes that's what it takes to resolve the issue. So so being brave and being part of the solution, not just identifying the problem and bringing it to the principal doesn't always work, yes. is what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. Always come up with an idea of a solution. And they, they may not take it, but if you have a concern and you've you know kind of done right. your research and figured right. out why it's like that, right. come up with some ideas and, and always be willing to share it because that shows that teacher leadership. And as right. you said, you don't have to have been in the field for 20 years. You can be a brand new person. You've got new ideas, share them. Yes. But have the courage to to share it. And I, I think what you're saying, which I love, is that you don't have to do that alone. You find your mentor to be the advocate with you, just as what we're saying is we're being advocates for our students, but the beginning teachers need someone to go with them to the principal, not yes. by themselves, yes. and maybe co create the solution and sometimes like you're saying that solution isn't the solution but the, it ripples it's brainstorming exactly. it ripples into something else Dennis what do you think about what we're saying does this relate to you you'll have a chance to share your bravery story but what what's your reaction to what we're saying oh gosh you know on, on so many levels I think that what Sean was just saying is you know and and you too Carol is um, we have to pay attention to the language that we use Yes. So, you know, the administrators are busy people and they don't like getting yelled at by anybody, but they actually get yelled at a fair amount. <laughs> yes, they do. You asked this really good question about bravery. I think one of the bravest things I ever heard a teacher say, um, and this was in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, where I, I did a lot of work for a number of years with community organizing for school improvement. The teacher said, uh, an angry parent is an opportunity. Oh, I love that. That's quite courageous because 
it says that the, the teacher understands that the parents don't know really what goes on in schools often. They, they, you know, they don't understand what's going on with test scores and you can do this and you can't do that and pull ins and push outs and computer assisted instruction and et cetera. You, you know, they might right. not it all, um, but their child might come home crying and really upset and not able to sleep. Um, and so I think that when educators are able to flip things like that, that actually the parents we should be worried about are the parents who don't care. <laughs> right. right. That's right. what we're worried about. We should worry about apathy, um, kids who are really neglected. Um, so I, I guess um, that that's just kind of one example of bravery. And then um, I, I'm not sure if this is an example of my bravery, but it's an example, I, I hope, of my responsiveness. I was in a meeting many years ago at Boston College, and the professors were all presenting their research and their methodologies and their findings. And a woman named Pat DiNatale, who was a cluster leader in the Boston Public Schools at the time, said at the end of all of these presentations, she said, you know, look, th th these are fascinating research questions, brilliant methodologies. I can't understand them. Uh, conclusions seem interesting. But as a, as a school-based educator, your questions are not our questions. And um, that gave me a headache for about six weeks. And then out of that, I thought, she's right. And I need to kind of go back and work with classroom teachers. I need to go back into the schools, work cheek by jowl with classroom teachers and learn from them. And then this is something I'd like to encourage uh, teachers to think about. Um, rarely did I ever have any teachers come after me and say, you know, I, I really need your best thinking on this. I, I, I really need you to kind of, you know, work with me around this. So when we think of that community supporting teachers, it's good to have those mentor teachers, good to have those leaders, but there's higher education faculty that could be pulled on also so that um, teaching is not so lonely as it, is, as it can feel sometimes. It, you, you know, that feeling when you're in the classroom and um, you have a runner in your class, the child's left the classroom. What do you do? You go over, you pick up the phone, you call down to the administration office, nobody picks up. What do you do? You go to the teacher in the next room over. You say, I, you know, I'm, I'm missing Jackie or whoever it might be. Teacher says, I'm sorry, man, I really got my hands full. What do you do? Right? Th these are really tough, tough issues that teachers face. And um, you're legally liable, right, for that class, right, even, even when others aren't there. So you're in a very vulnerable position. What I think is really beautiful uh, about what you two are offering to your podcast is you're offering a community, a community where people can talk about those really, really hard things where you do need to have some courage. And sometimes just to go into the building the next day after something outrageous had happened and, you know, maybe you messed up, right? You know, right. Have courage to say, you know, I'm sorry I shouted at you. You, you know, I really did something out of turn. And courageous teachers can say that to a whole class. Thank you, Dennis, for underscoring that and showing that bravery and courage, it's ha it's ongoing. What do you, Sean, what's your reaction to some of the things that you just heard Dennis talk about, the research and being a, his education experiences from that perspective. And I, I worked in higher ed for 20 years as well, but always felt like I was a classroom teacher the whole time. What, what, what do you think, Sean? Um, I think I, I really like what you're saying, Dennis, about how you want to partner more with teachers. Um, I graduated back in the 90s, so I, you know, I've been around for a while, and it seemed very separate. And what we learned in school didn't really transfer. I felt like as a beginning teacher, the things I learned were so philosophical that I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so I think what Dennis is saying about how we need to kind of make sure that we are, that in the colleges, the professors are actually doing the, answering the questions that the teachers on the ground need. I think that is really important. I'm so glad to hear that now. Um, and what I see from the newer teachers coming out, they are having that kind of experience. So that's the first thing, which I feel like is just so much better for our teachers coming out. They are going to be better prepared coming into the schools. Thank you for underscoring. And I want to point out something, Dennis, that from my experience, when we were collaborating, when I was at Boston College leading the student teaching program, I found you to be so brave 
in that you co-taught a university master's course with the first grade teacher. Like when I put out this idea, this crazy idea to all the professors in the education department, and I remember this saying, let's get closer to those teacher issues. Who wants to co-teach or invite even guest speakers from the classroom to do what Sean's talking about, talk about the scenarios that are actually happening and put them in the context of the research and the philosophy, which I think are very valuable. And in my memory, Dennis, I think you were the only professor who did it. <laughs> so what was that experience like co-teaching? Because you're very philosophical if I may say so. <laughs> and you worked with a first grade teacher. Why did you say yes? Well, what, what are we even in this field for, right? right? You, you, you know, life is short. Life is, life is fleeting and very short. And, um, and we don't know how long any of us have, right? So, so you know, you kind of have to figure out. I mean, higher education is getting more and more, I'm just going to speak bluntly, messed up. Because now there's all these ways of measuring professors' productivity, which has to do with how how often other people cite their research, right? Right. But, but right. Meanwhile, you have these student teachers right in front of you. You have them going out into the schools. And Carol, I have to say, okay, you know, maybe I had some courage, but you had stamina. <laughs> I did have stamina. I didn't take no for an answer. In a right. Quarter of a century. <laughs> I to get a higher education faculty excited about working cheek by jaw with classroom teachers. You must be the world's biggest masochist. <laughs> <laughs> to try to bring the partners together. Well, yeah. but you did it. What did you most enjoy about teaching, co teaching with a first grade teacher? Uh, well, it, you know, what it, stood out? Look, look, um, I'm curious. Yeah, it, you were, okay. Maybe part okay. of bravery could be um, having the humility to say that you don't know everything. All right. But yeah, you, you don't. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, first grade teachers, they're so great. One of the things, I know we're going to be getting to the practical stuff in a little bit, but um, I, I, I'm very lucky. I've been able to do research in a lot of different places. I was working in Ontario, Canada. This comes up in a the book on well-being that I wrote with Andy, well-being in schools with Andy Hargraves. Think of the difference if you're a teacher or if you're a kid or if you're a parent with referring to students who have low test scores as marker students or bubble kids on the one hand or referring to them as students of wonder or students of mystery on the other hand. We don't know what's going on in their minds. You know, we, we, we really don't know. And so a practical thing for all of us to do is to review our language. What's the language? What are the labels we're putting on our kids? And when you, when you use a language, I mean, it was so wonderful to listen to these, um, to these teachers talk because they'd say, well, I have a wondering, you know, there's something that's a mystery for me. And the language that we use can open up inquiry and exploration or it can shut it down. And honestly, I, I, I think just... I'm not that noble. I think I was getting a little bit bored with the self-imposed blinders that we put on in higher ed. And um, the other thing, Carol, is that, you know, I'd, I'd been working for a number of years um, in the schools before that that team teaching happened. And this is was really great <laughs> because I started hiring the teachers to teach some of the higher ed classes on their own and they started having the highest teaching evaluation. Yes, <laughs> I forgot that you did that. <laughs> yes, we started hiring the teachers. <laughs> they were teaching the reading courses. Okay, Sean, you gotta weigh in on all this. What what are you thinking about this this collaboration that Dennis and I did years yeah. ago that I think we need to resurface yeah, uh, with our it. listeners? What do you think? That sounds amazing. Um, I think that I really do think that because I used to want to be a professor for that reason, because I wanted to go in and say this was when I got out of school, this is what I experienced. And I want to share that with the with teachers that are in you know pre-service. So what you're talking about is exactly that. Um, and having, you know, when I went to school in Auburn University, we had adjunct professors who were current classroom teachers who came in. But I think even having, instead of just having them teach a certain class and a professor teach a class, that co-teaching model, I think would be amazing 
for so many students. Um, but there was something, oh, I don't know, it, something that Dennis had said that had me think of something, and I was like, oh, I wanted to talk about that, and now it's It'll it's come gone. back. If It'll it come comes back. back, bring it back. If it comes back, meant to be. We're going to shift a little bit. Thank you both for this very invigorating conversation um, that kind of goes in a lot of different ways about bravery it's not just one incident it's it's ongoing just showing up if you're a beginning teacher being brave to show up every day if you're a professor to reach out to schools and actually uh, let's do research on the questions that relate to what's re really going on in schools and then having classroom teachers um, reach out to the university so anybody listening i hope our listeners will if you're in a college town, if you have student teachers, I think we need to say, come in, come in and help us. We need some research on this. We need some research on that. Um, oh, okay, Sean, what do, you, what do you think? What do you think? So I was thinking with, when Dennis was talking about how we change the language and how we label students, and it made me think about how it's so important for teachers to have an assets-based approach. We no longer call our students English language learners because that's a deficit-based approach saying what they're lacking. Now we want to call them multilingual learners because it's saying what they are bringing is an asset and we are building and creating more assets for them. So I think that that's important. Um, as Dennis was talking about the labels we use, yes. try to remember to have that asset-based approach. Like you were saying, uh, students of wonder, wondering what's, what they're thinking instead of, you know, that they're not doing that. So I think that's important for yes, all of I our teachers to, that. to well, have an assets-based approach. Yes, and I didn't even think of that because I have a course that I help teach you with, and it's called ELL, yeah, English mm -hmm. Language Learner. And I never thought, thank you, I'm going to change the course title. So <laughs> this is, but this is what happens when you have these kinds of conversations. It looks like one little thing, but you, that brings up, the power of the words which Dennis is into. So let's shift a bit. Okay, our listeners are ready for some practical advice or some strategies from all of the wisdom, Dennis, all the writing, all the research. What do you, what do you have that you would like to share with the listeners that um, can make their day better or that they can use to forward their teaching experience in a successful way? What shows up for you? So um, I'll just mention one thing that kind of came up for some of my freshman college students this um, year, and that is that um, a lot of them don't know why they're in the university, what they're doing, and they wanted to please their parents, they wanted to please their teachers, and now they're sitting here, and what on earth are they doing here? So students will say these kinds of things, right? You know, kind of across the, the it's part, it's a human thing. You know, what am I doing here? Why? What, you know, what matters here? So you can do a very simple little exercise and, and, um, and kind of interrupt what you're doing or build it into a lesson. And it's called, um, have your students write purpose statements. Say, well, what, do, you know, what's your purpose with your life? What do you want to do? And then my students will challenge me. I, you know, I teach a lot of football players sit in the back of the classroom who like to put me in the hot seat, right? So, so what, what's your purpose, right? And so my, my purpose um, is to improve the human condition through education and to love my friends and family with all my might. Two things. Very simple, but I didn't get it from a box, right? Yeah, you got Every it from your heart. That's a heart-centered statement, yes. Everybody has to spend time working on their purpose statement, right? And if, if, if teachers can do this kind of thing, and this is very much research-supported, you, you get the motivations going again, right? Uh -huh. so, so, you know, say you just have, you know, minor classroom management issues. Say, well, well wait a minute, what, what are you here for? Right. Let's let's go back and look at your purpose statement. What you know, and you know, really, it, it's very hard. And so, so then the momentum starts coming from them, and it's an opportunity to get to know the students, kind of, kind of at any, at any age or you know any grade level. So, um, Sean, you're teaching first graders or kindergartners. 
uh, right now I'm teaching multilingual learners um, and I particularly work with, I typically work with fourth and fifth grade, but I have taught all the grade levels. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, at, at every level, you know, kids are kind of, I mean, in kindergarten, it's the cutest, right? Because they'll just kind of blurt out anything and, um, and just make your day with, you know, some wonderful little comment. You know, I was in one kindergarten class and the teacher's talking with the kids about, you know, things that they like to collect. And one kid says, I know what you like to collect. And then the teacher says, well, what? What do I like to collect? You like to collect children. <laughs> As they all are there. I love it. It's been very it, perceptive. You know, oh, the students. You know, and the teachers, too, though, need the purpose. It's the what's your why. We say, why are you here? What, why did you choose to become a teacher? Uh, Sean shared, like, when she just made the decision, but I feel like we all revisit that over and over. Okay, why am I still here? <laughs> why am I still supporting teachers? All Because I love it. And I could see a need for us to have these conversations. And if that's what I can do, that's my purpose right now. Mm -hmm. Sean, what's your uh, practical message uh, that either builds on Dennis's or how are you uh, uh, going to share with us what your wisdom? Well, um, going back to what Dennis said is I actually have a mission statement that I write out every morning. Um, so I'm wondering if that's something that maybe would help some of our students, you know, college students who are saying, you know, why am I here? Kind of think about what is, what is your purpose? And it's a sentence and I write it every morning to remind me of what the type of person, how I want to be in this world. So that would be, um, a strategy possibly. But what I was thinking is, is that every year you're going to have something that you feel probably, um, unsure about. And when you're first teaching, it's going to be a lot of different things. So what I would say is pick one area that you really want to work on and improve. You can't do everything. And sometimes you feel like, you know, I have to be the expert at everything or I can't ask for help. But choose the one thing that you really want to get better on and have a focus on that because that's how you will improve and change over time. If you try to do everything, you're not going to be good at anything. I so love that, that would be my practical strategy. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like you to share with uh, the audience uh, your hobby or interest in having your own podcast, <laughs> which I have been a guest a couple times and have thoroughly enjoyed it. I was with beginning teacher each time, and I really enjoyed that conversation. But tell tell us the title, the, how this happened. Let's hear this, this uh, story. Sure. So um, over on t formerly known as Twitter, now X, there is a Tuesday night ed chat, it's hashtag ed chat, um, where they just talk about education issues and topics. And so I was one of the moderators for the chat, and I was the co-host of the podcast that followed the chat. Um, and then as the only moderator and co-host at the time who was actually still teaching in the classroom, the producers of the BAM Radio Network, which is where you can find the podcast, lots of different podcasts on education, they asked me if I would be willing to host a podcast called We Just Want to Teach, which gives teaching strategies, stories, tips, and tricks just really to help provide some some information and some inspiration to teachers. And it's and as you said, Carol, you're typically paired with the new teacher because I've, what I found was it's great having that person who's a veteran and that person who's new because after 28 years or 27 years, I can remember some things, but it's nice to have someone who's brand new and to have those questions that we can answer and support them with. Um, so that's how I got into that. And you're that's, still doing it. And so I'm you're planning doing your, it. Yeah, doing the fall and okay, we'll be in touch. I've got yes, some ideas absolutely. for you. Teaching with light. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I love oh it. Oh my God. The time has gone by so quickly. I love this. So I have just a few easy questions for the, for the end of the show. Everybody likes to know like, okay, you two are pretty busy people. You have a podcast, you're writing books, blah, blah, blah. Well, how do you stay inspired, motivated, healthy, balanced, whatever you call it? Dennis, what do you do? I dance. 
You dance <laughs> it, uh, alone or are you dancing with a partner? Tell me more. <laughs> Ballroom uh, dancing. Yeah, so I, I dance with my wife. I dance with my daughter. I dance with friends. But I started to... Um, there's a fun movie. It's Richard Gere, Jennifer Lopez movie, Shall We Dance? And it's about oh. a guy who's kind of like stuck in his mid-career in, in Chicago, and he, he just starts taking dance classes. And a, a lot of us live in our heads, you know? Yes. And, and the body is something for carrying with the brain around in. But but you kind of get out on a dance floor, <laughs> and, you know, I have very good instructors. I, I go to Arthur Murray Dance Studio nearby here. They're all over the country, you, you know? Fun. You, you get out there, and, and you know... Like, it's so funny because I'll, I'll tell many people, well, I'm going to these dance classes. And people say, well, I'd love to do that, but I don't know how to dance. <laughs> That's why you're going to get a class. class. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you can start working on, um, you know, there's a lot of Latin dances that are very popular now. So salsa, merengue, bachata. Ooh, I can see uh, you. Yes. You know, you know, all of those things, you know, then, then you know, waltz, if you want, a jitterbug. You got all kinds of different things. But um, I, I think that for me, the, um, the connection, the human connection without seeing a word, but just floating across that dance floor is just sublime. I love it. I love to dance. My husband and I have taken lessons. We're not very good, but I, and that's a judgment, but we just love just going to the lessons and I think we're getting better, and I love the fox trot. And yeah. we haven't gotten into the tango. That's a little. What's your favorite dance, Dennis? Um, I, I'd Do you say have a favorite. Well, yeah. Um, well, the, the the ones that I'm having the most fun with right now would be um, bachata, the rumba, and the waltz. Oh, Those the rumba! Ones. Yes, I love that. Yeah. Yes. All right. What do you think? So, what are you doing to to stay inspired, Sean? So. Um, I go into my basement um, and that's where I work out. I get in daily joyful movement and it can be different things, but I go into the basement by myself. Sometimes my puppy comes in the room and, you know, oh, who's your puppy? what's your puppy's name? Miles. He's a miniature schnauzer. We call him a oh. little terrorizer. He likes no one but my <laughs> husband and me. He tolerates <laughs> our son. Like even oh sometimes ever, he, <laughs> terrible, but I just go there and at 30 minutes and I just, I take care of myself. And I just decompress and move. Um, You're and moving move. and moving both your body. Moving. That's yes. so interesting that you both move, that, that our bodies help us to connect. So one thing I do that I've shared in my other episodes is um, when I became the yoga teacher, I learned how to do hand mudras, like yoga for your hands. And I discovered that just pausing for a few, two minutes could mm -hmm. re that I didn't need 30 minutes. Like, I, I want to do that too. But the one that we'll put into the um, description for this podcast so that you all can see it is uh, a two-minute mudra called, um, what is, a mudra of well-being. So it kind of fits with this conversation. And it's moving the negative thoughts away. So sometimes we have to literally move that to have courage Mm -hmm. And to just get out of our heads, <laughs> which sometimes they, our minds will talk us out of being brave very quickly. Um, so I hope I hope you and the listeners will take a look at that. All right, we're winding down, and the la uh, next to the last question is, I want to talk about change. Dick Elmore had this prompt. I used to think. And now I think I want our listeners and our beginning teachers to know that we do change over time. We, we don't have to come into the profession with one idea and then that's it. Um, so Sean, what did you used to think? And now what do you think? Um, I used to think that having parental support was good. You know, I would take it. Um, but now I know that it takes more than just me and the parents. It takes the entire village. That means your counselors. That means your teammates on your grade level. It could be community members. It really makes a difference when you have that whole community that's coming around our students um, and us as teachers so that we're all going to be doing our best. We can't do it by ourselves. We need to have that support. Thank you. And Dennis? I used to think, and now I think. 
Oh, I, I think I used to think that educational change was a lot easier than it turns out to be. <laughs> yeah, that's facts. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I used to kind of think, well, here's what the research says about you know, multilingual learners or, you know, kids with dyslexia or these things, and now we just need to go do that. But I, I see that it's more complex than that. And I see all of the human beings who are involved. And I try and draw inspiration from thinking, what do we got in our public school system in the U.S.? About 50 million kids, I think, last time I checked, you, you, you know, in the 16,000 school districts. It's kind of amazing if you can kind of think about it that I know we have an enrollment crisis. We have all kinds of issues right now, but you know we've we've been through a lot, especially in these last years. I'm thinking of COVID in particular, and yet still, you know, people get up in the morning. Kids get up, they go to school. They're curious. They want to learn. They want to make something of themselves. And and so I think um, I I'm a, I'm a much less into you know what I think we should do now, and okay. more curious about. These generations keep on changing. <laughs> yes, they do. So being open to that. So what do you want to celebrate, Dennis? Be, you know, kind of in that matter. vein. What What do you want to celebrate around I education? Celebrate, you know, I celebrate the teachers who, um, who, who somehow managed to teach online during the pandemic, who now are trying to figure out AI, who are... Um, dealing with kids from all different kinds of backgrounds, all different kinds of personalities, and still manage to kind of get up there every day and and do it with so much love and dedication and wisdom. You know, so so many classical virtues. So I, I draw a lot of inspiration from the people that are listening to this podcast, you, you know, and they don't have to do this. They could do something else, but they want to improve their minds and are curious about what others are thinking. And all, all of you. <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. Sean, the last word, what would you like to celebrate as we close out our Teacher to Teacher podcast, episode eight? Um, I would just love to share. That I, I want to piggyback on what Dennis said, is that, you know, if the way I started with Ed Chat was I was just listening to the podcast with my son on the way to school. And for the teachers that are listening to podcasts who are picking up those PDs, who are taking that initiative, I think we want to celebrate them. But we also want to remember that there are some people who feel so overwhelmed, they don't know where to begin. So maybe share that little thing that you have. Share Ed Chat. Share the Teacher to Teacher podcast. Share the book Teaching with Life, with Light, not Life, excuse me. Share the thing that you have found so that others can learn and be lifted up as well. Thank you. And congratulations is in order. I know that you're you're stepping into a, a new leadership position. Just kind of say what that is so everybody can congratulate you. Yes. So um, I'm currently a lead ML teacher, but I'm actually going to be moving into more of a coaching role. It's called a multilingual um, learner instructional specialist. And so I'm going to be going into a school that's what we call high density. They have a lot of multilingual learners in their building and really working with teachers um, to help support them by modeling lessons, by working with them on how to make sure that their lessons are accessible for students, that their assessments are actually accessible and we can learn and see what our teach what our students actually know. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to work um, and hopefully impact more than just the students I see on my caseload, but all of the students in an entire elementary school. So you'll be mentoring. You'll I be doing be teacher. You'll be doing teacher leadership. You'll be uh, your dream job. It is Which, my dream job. It's your dream job. So I want to say to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to Teacher to Teacher with this exciting conversation where we're bridging the gap between higher education and K-12 schools. And I want you to remind you to remember to stay inspired, stay healthy, and don't forget to share your good news. Thank you to the guest today, and I hope you will join us for episode nine, which is called Dream Out Loud, so you can create your own dream jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining today's Teacher to Teacher conversation. We hope this time together energized you, inspired you, and reminded you why you chose to become a teacher. 
You can purchase any of Carol's books and any books mentioned in the podcast online at www.corwin.com. Please leave a review and share this podcast with your colleagues. Thank you for listening to the Corwin Teacher to Teacher podcast, a place to share teacher wisdom and engage in authentic conversations with experienced educators. Come explore Corwin's free new teacher toolkit and resources. We've curated these resources based on extensive research from teachers, coaches, and principals alike. Whether you are brand new or a veteran teacher, find ready-to-go teaching tools at corwin.com today.